So for the last eight weeks, we've been talking about the noise that we all deal with in our life. And one of the things we need to understand is every one of us, we have some type of noise. Now, your noise may be different than my noise, but we all have noise. It may be anxiety. It may be worry. It may be fear. It may be anger. It may be lust or temptations or, or all kinds of things. So it doesn't matter what your noise is. We all have noise. And we saw that this noise begins real quick. I forgot. Uh, if no one doesn't have a, a handout tonight, Parker and Ben have one. If you need one, keep your hands up. They'll get one into your hands tonight. <clears throat> noise begins by unbelief in our heart. There's a lot of us who, we, a lot of Christians, a lot of us in this room, we know what the Bible says about God. We know the Bible says God is merciful. We know the Bible says God is gracious. We know the Bible says God is loving. We know the Bible says God is faithful. And so we know that truth and the problem isn't that we don't know the truth. It's a lot like what I talked about this morning, that we, we know the truth, but we're not living it. Yeah, we know God is loving, God is faithful, God is gracious. We just don't believe he's all those things to me. Because if God loved me, he wouldn't allow things, bad things to happen to me. If God was merciful, I wouldn't be suffering. If God was gracious, then I'd have everything I want. And so we look at what the Bible says about God and says, man, that's good and that's true for everybody but me. And it's an unbelief that begins a discontentment in our heart. We are discontent with what God has given us. Everything we have was given to us by God the Father. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. Everything in your life. And the thing is, it's not just the good, it's the bad things. It's the sicknesses, the illnesses, the pain, the suffering. All these things that we have are given to us by God the Father. And so this unbelief, not, not believing the characteristics of God, causes discontentment, brings anxiety and anger in our hearts, and eventually leads us to despair. So we started seeing a couple weeks ago that the way out of this noise is to know what the Bible says about God, to understand that the Bible teaches that God is more than enough for us in every area of our life. The love of God is more than enough. We need to be content with the love that God has given us. We saw the mercy of God. We saw mercy, of course, was God rescuing us from our miserable condition. The mercy of God is more than enough for us. Tonight, we're going to look at the faithfulness of God. So let's look in Lamentations chapter number 3. We're going to start reading verse number 21. He says, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. So Jeremiah here, the, the weeping prophet, you know, I called him the crybaby prophet. I was making a little joke there, but he's the, he's the weeping prophet. He is weeping over Israel. He is weeping over Jerusalem. Please turn off your cell phones. Game started, John. <laughs> he is weeping over Israel. He is weeping over, over Jerusalem and the destruction about it. Not just the destruction of Israel, but also the spiritual condition of the entire nation of Israel. They have rejected God. They have turned their back on God. They have, have gone away from Him. That's why God sent punishment. That's why God sent persecution. That's why God sent oppression. And so Jeremiah looks at the spiritual condition of Israel. He looks at the physical condition of Jerusalem. The walls are torn down. The temple has been destroyed. And he is weeping over Israel. But he says in verse number 21, he says, he says, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Jeremiah says, I remember how good God has been to Israel. I remember how good God has been to me. And when I remember the goodness of God, it may not seem like God's good right now, but I, when I remember the goodness of God, when I remember the faithfulness of God, he said it gives me hope. So let's look at what he's remembering. Look at, look at what he is remembering that gives him hope in verse number 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Jeremiah is making it sound like almost every night when you go to sleep and you drift off into dreamland that God's in heaven thinking up new ways to be merciful to you. Thinking up new ways to be faithful to you. 
thinking up new ways to rescue you from your spiritual condition. He's thinking up new ways to give you mercy the following day. And Jeremiah says, I remember every day I woke up and needed mercy. It was there for me. I remember every day I woke up and needed God. He was there for me. He was always faithful to me. And Jeremiah says, that gives me hope. My city's destroyed. My nation's turned their back on God. But I remember how good God has been. And that gives me hope. Look at verse 24. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. What that means there is Jeremiah says, God is more than enough for me. He says, God's all I need. I don't need my city to be rebuilt. I don't need, the, I don't need my nation to be restored. All I need is God. And look at verse 25. The Lord is good unto him that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. In Deuteronomy chapter number 4, God comes to the nation of Israel, and he tells them that even though they are in captivity, he says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. You know, God doesn't play hide and seek with us. God's not up in heaven saying, well, if they do certain amount of things or if they jump through all these hoops, then I'll reveal myself to them. No, God says, look, if you look for me, you'll find me. You know, a lot of people say, I just don't see God in this situation. It's because you're not looking for him. I don't see God working in my life. It's because you're not looking for him. Because God said in Deuteronomy, and Jeremiah reminds us here in Jeremiah 25, that if we are patient and we look for God, we will always see him. God doesn't play hide and seek. He doesn't make us go on a spiritual scavenger hunt. God wants us to see him. God wants us to see him work because God wants us to glorify him. God wants us to see him work because he knows in the difficult times we need to remember those times he was there and say, God, I remember your goodness and that gives me hope. That helps me continue. That helps me go on with you. Jeremiah says, I have hope because I remember that God is good to them that wait on him and God reveals himself to those that look for him. And look at verse number 26. He says, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Doesn't say noisily wait. Jeremiah says, it is good that a man would hope and quietly wait for God to deliver him from his miserable condition. That is an incredible promise that God gives to us. God says, look, when things get... When things get cattywampus in your life, when things, y'all don't know what that, y'all know what that word means, cattywampus, right? Things start going a different way, not the way you plan. When things start going wrong, God says, don't panic, don't freak out, don't cause a bunch of noise and ruckus trying to fix it yourself, just patiently and quietly wait on God to show up. Because here's the promise God gives us. He will always show up. You know, the problem we have is God doesn't show up when we want him to. God shows up when he needs to show up. We want him to show up immediately. You know, we'd like for God to show up before the bad things happen, right? You know, I I hate waiting on stuff. I really, when I go, I'll be honest with you, I, I hate Walmart. You'll go there, 700 registers, three are open. And now they got these self-checkout things, but they closed them down. Why are you going to shut down a, cl- a checkout yourself register? So they have all these registers, they shut, and you'll get there, and you'll, you know, I, 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 we'll, we'll get a few things, and we'll get in line behind somebody who the only register's open. They have four baskets full. And they're just, just taking their sweet time, and the cashier's just taking her sweet time, and they must know each other because they're talking. I'm just getting, I'm getting so frustrated. I'm getting so angry. And April always says... God's just sparing you from an accident down the road. I hate that. I'm like, you know what? He's God. He can get me over it. He can hold that accident off until I'm through. He doesn't got to hold me up. He can get me ahead of it. So we want God to work in our timetable. And God says, I don't work in your timetable. God says, I work when I want to work. And God promises, promises us he will always show up. You know, too many people, we view God as heavy-handed 
and mean. We look at him as we, we, we look at God as if he is looking for an excuse to punish us. God is an angry father who is looking for any reason whatsoever to destroy us. I can tell you that's not true because I have given him countless ways and countless opportunities to punish me and destroy me and hasn't done it yet. God's not looking to hurt us. God's not looking to destroy us. God wants to be good to us. God wants to bless us. The fact that we have not been destroyed is proof that his faithfulness is great towards us. Now, these truths that we're learning these last several weeks, they're not something that we're to look at once and then kind of put away for a foul cabinet later. These are truths that we need to remember and bring to mind every single day. Jeremiah says, your, your mercies are great every morning. Every day you get up, you need to remind yourself, God, you're merciful to me. God, you're faithful to me. God, whenever I need you, you're going to be there. God, there may be a time today where I need you. And Lord, I may look around and think you're not there, but Lord, I know you're always faithful. You always show up. So you'll be here when I need you. We need to remind ourselves every single day, God's faithfulness is great. God's all we need. He will always show up. <clears throat> we know all of these truths, but we've forgotten them. And that's, that's why we have noise in our souls. We're a lot like the nation of Israel in Judges chapter 8, where the Bible says, And the children of Israel remember not the Lord their God. Jeremiah says, I have hope. Because I remember how good God has been to me. And look, let's just be real honest here. Every one of us here, God's been good to you. God's been better to you than you deserve. And I can say that because he's been better to me than I deserve. And Jeremiah says, look, you can have peace. You can have quietness in your soul. When no matter what you're going through, you remember, God, you've always been good to me. You're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You never change. So God, if you've always been good to me, that means you always will be good to me. We need to rest in the faithfulness of God. That's how we have hope as well. Not, know, not by knowing the truth of God's love, God's mercy, and God's faithfulness, but by remembering God loves us. Remembering God is merciful. Remembering God is faithful. That's why daily devotions, that's why regular church attendance is so important because we tend to forget what God's done for us, and we need to be reminded. So as we continue to see these truths to have a quiet, quiet soul, let's look at the faithfulness of God toward us. Here's the first thing we need to look at. What does it mean that God is faithful? What does it mean that God is faithful? Faithfulness is part of God's immutability. That's a big word for saying God doesn't change. Hey, Kevin, can we put that up? God doesn't change. Ever. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is faith, God's faithfulness is part of his unchanging nature. The word faithfulness means steadiness or firmness. God is always faithful. Always. You know, everything changes. The weather changes. You know, in February in Virginia, it can be 30 degrees one day and 72 the next. Weather changes. Political parties change. Political climate changes. The job market changes. Your health changes. Your weight changes. Your income changes. All these things change. And in a constantly changing world, God never does change. We need something stable to anchor ourselves to. And God says, no matter what you're going through, no matter how your life changes, how your situation changes, God says, I will never change. God is always faithful. God will always be exactly as he is in the Bible. And God will always be exactly as he is now. No part of him can change. Nothing about God can change. Look at how the Bible describes the faithfulness of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 9, the Bible says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments 
to a thousand generations. God says, I'll keep my promise for a thousand generations. That's a, that's a whole lot of generations that God has promised. Says, hey, I will never change. Psalms 102 verse 25. Bible says, of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same. The world around us changes. You know, they, uh, when they design Mount Rushmore, and they, you know, blew up that beautiful mountain to put those ugly faces on it. They designed Mount Rushmore to disintegrate. So as the winds hit it, that it would eventually go back to the natural shape of the mountain. I can't remember. Thousands of years they're planning on this thing to take. But the mountains change because the wind breaks against them. The, the shoreline changes because the, the waves crash against the shoreline and just slowly erode the shoreline. So even the world around us changes. The stars change. You know, whoever has seen a blinking star? A blinking star. You look outside, oh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. That twinkling star is a star that died, you know, several million light years away. And uh, you're wishing on a star that's been dead for, for a while. And so your wishes are dead, amen? That's what it means. No. Uh, but, you know, we look at the, the stars change because stars die. Black holes come in and they, they, they go out. So nature changes. And Psalm says, Lord, like our clothes wear out, this world is wearing out. But God, you never change. When this world is long gone, God will, never, God will still be the same. God, ne- you know what that means? When this world is long gone, God's love for you will still be the same. God's provision for you will still be the same. God's protection of you, will, because they can never change. So God will always be the same. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and how he not not make it good? The Bible says there, it says, look, God's not a man. If God, what that means there is when God makes a promise to you, he's going to keep it. God always keeps his word. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God says, look, I haven't destroyed you people because my mercy never changes. Aren't you glad God never gets sick of you? You know, let's face it. There are people in our life that we just get tired of hearing from. That friend or relative, who the only time they call you is when they need something. We, we all got somebody like that who they only call you when they need something. You fit, your phone rings, and you see who it is, and you debate, do I really want to answer this or send it to voicemail? I just send it to voicemail. And so you look at it, oh, man, there's, they, they want something. And there are people in our life we get tired of dealing with. We get, you know, there are people in our life who they, they may struggle with the same sin over and over and over again. You're like, man, you've been dealing with this sin for the last 20 years. It's time to conquer it, get over it, or, or go, go do something else. Stop messing. And we get frustrated with people. God never does. You can come to God a thousand times for the same thing, and his forgiveness is always there because he is faithful. God never changes. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. James says, look, not only is there no difference in God, there's no even appearance that he may even consider changing. God is always the same. God finishes everything he starts. He never leaves us. He always gives us what we need. He always forgives us. He always leads us. God never changes. To change in any way would mean that he would have to, he has to change for better or for worse. If you change any, you, you're, any change you make in your life, it's either change for the better or for the worse. That's the same with God. If God changed in any way, it would be a change for the better or for the worse. But God's perfect. So he can't change for the better. But God's perfect. So he can't change for the worse. God can never change. That's where we get our stability. That's why Jeremiah said he could hope. Because no matter how the world changed around him, 
He knew God was always the same. And that's where we can have our hope as well. Everything about God exists in perfect harmony. You know, God's attributes do not fight against each other, so they don't need to change. He doesn't have to temper his justice because his mercy and perfect, his perfect mercy and his perfect justice fit together perfectly. His love doesn't have to mellow out his wrath because his perfect wrath doesn't have any problem with his perfect love. God is the same and perfect and absolute in all of his ways. So what does it mean that God is faithful? It means God never changes. Second thing we need to understand, what makes God so unchangeable? What makes God so unchangeable? Now, don't, don't ignore this point because you think we're going to get deep theology on you or something like that, because this, this, is, this is necessary. We need to understand that. This is the foundation that we must understand if we're going to have stability and have quiet souls. So what makes God so unchangeable? First thing that makes God so unchangeable? God is unchangeable because he is the self-existent one. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, who? God. Who was there in the beginning? God was. Who made everything? Who made God? God. <laughs> and that, that's a problem, you know, people can't wrap their head around. Well, if God made everything, who made God? He's just, he's, he's, he's still, I can't explain it. He can explain it to you when you get to heaven. But I know that God doesn't change because God exists by himself. No one created him. He always has been. Before anything was ever created, God was there ready to create. He wasn't created because he existed already. So why does that matter? That means that since God wasn't created by anything, that God is free from all changes. You know, we have people in our lives that are wanting us to change all the time. You know, you go to your doctor, he's going to want you to change everything about you. Change your weight, change your appearance, change all this stuff. You know, I went to my doctor the other week, he changed my blood pressure medicine. Idiot, he changed it and my blood pressure went through the roof. So we had to change it back. Said, Stop changing me, doc. Leave me alone. But every, there are people that always want us to change. Change your phone company. Change your TV provider. Change your mechanic. Change the soap that you use. And, and they spend a lot of money to influence us to change. God cannot be influenced to change. He existed before anything. And anything that does exist is under his control. Everything we see, God controls it. So none of those things that God created can force him to do something against his will. Nothing that he created can convince him to change. Now, we're not like that. We change with the weather. We change with the attitudes of others. We change with the meal that we ate for lunch. We ch the littlest thing can change us. Bad traffic on the way to work can ruin your day and change your attitude. When we respond that way, it's because we are thinking of ourselves over everyone else. But God thinks of everyone else over himself. God created everything. God is the self -ex God doesn't need any of this. That's what we need to understand. See, we change because we need stuff. We need things, so we change for it. God doesn't need anything. Now, God wants you, which is incredible. But God doesn't need you. So God doesn't need to change. He's a self-existent one. We see number two. <clears throat> God is unchangeable because he is the infinite one. Anybody know how long eternity is? <laughs> Can't explain eternity. You talk about eternity. You see, we have a starting point. You were born one day. I was born January 13th, 1978. That was my starting point. Now, I was born again April 12th, 1996. So from that day on, I ne I, once I was born, I never had an ending point. Even if I died and went to hell, I would live for eternity in hell, which is bad because eternity is <laughs> doesn't end. There's no end to it. Now, I know when you're at the DMV, it seems like eternity, but it's not. But every one of us, we had a beginning point. Now, we have no end, but we had a beginning point. 
God didn't have a beginning. He just, he always has been. So how do you explain that, preacher? I, I can't. There's some things the Bible says are, are, are above us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So there's some things we can say, well, you know what? I just, I can't explain it, but it's just, God's always been. You know, when Moses was talking to God, God came to him in the burning bush, said, Moses, I want you to go lead my people out of Egypt, take them out of captivity. Moses does some arguments. He goes, well, God, when I get there and tell them, God wanted me to take them out, who, who am I supposed to say sent me? And God said, you tell them, I am, have sent you. He said, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am <coughs> has sent me unto you. What God is saying is you go and tell them the one that has always been and the one that will always be, the infinite one, the one with no beginning and no end, the Alpha and the Omega, he has sent you. The never changing one has sent me to get you and you can trust him. He was reminding them that long before they were born, he promised to lead Abraham to a promise land. He was going to keep his word. So Moses said, well, that's good for me. That should be good for us as well. He never has to change on any promise because he is infinite. He has always kept his word and he always will. God's infinity means God never runs out of love. God never runs out of mercy. God never runs out of grace. God never runs out of patience. God never runs out of goodness. God has no limitations. And God never changes. So number three, why does it matter that God is faithful? What does the faithfulness of God really mean to us? How does, how does the faithfulness of God give us stability? Well, here's some things I want you to know. First of all, without a clear view of his faithfulness, you will have little testimony for God. If you don't understand the faithfulness of God, you won't be able to have any testimony to the lost world for God. James 1.8, what this means is you won't be stable. James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you can't settle your mind on the goodness and the faithfulness of God, you will be unstable in every area of your life because God's faithfulness fuels our faithfulness. If you don't understand his faithfulness, you're going to have several problems. Here's some problems you're going to have. First of all, you will be plagued by sins that you cannot overcome. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation you, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that year, able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Look, I know we have these things we call besetting sins. These are our stumbling blocks or our whatever, you, bad, whatever you want to call them. And if you don't understand the faithfulness of God to deliver you from those sins, you're going to struggle with them your entire life. You'll have sins you can't undergo. God doesn't say he'll get away, he'll get you away from the temptation, but he says he is faithful to help you bear it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 <clears throat> faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. All these are promises about God's sanctifying work in your life. When you got saved, God said, I promise to sanctify you. To from your, the moment you accepted me as your Savior, to the moment you see me face to face, to shape you and conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And that takes a lot of plucking out the sins from your life. That takes a lot of helping you overcome these sins and overcome these temptations. But if you're not settled on the faithfulness of God, you're going to struggle with sins your entire life. He's going to rescue us, and he's going to be faithful to do so. Another problem you're going to run into is you will struggle with the assurance of your salvation and forgiveness of sins. The fact that you are forgiven rests on his faithfulness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us. That means if we come to God and confess our sins, no matter how many times we do it, no matter what sin it is, 
God says, you come to me, you are humble yourself, you confess your sin. God says, I am faithful to forgive you and cleanse you. You know why people struggle with their assurance of salvation? Because they don't believe the faithfulness of God. Because we're not looking at God, we're looking at ourselves. How could God love someone like me? How could God forgive someone who God, I come to him every single day about this exact same sin and I know me, I would not forgive him, forgive me, so why would God? Because God's faithful and we're not. We need to understand that no matter what we go through, no matter what sins we have, God is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, and look, this is hard for us to understand, God forgives murder. God forgives immorality. God forgives abortion. God forgives drug abuse. God forgives worry. They're on the same playing field with God. God forgives anger. God forgives lust. God forgives lying. No matter what we come to, if we confess it, if we admit we are wrong and he is right, God says, I am faithful to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is a faithful promise promise that God's given us. But not only will you struggle with assurance of salvation, here's another problem you have. You will struggle with loneliness. Hebrews chapter 13, 5, Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. People say, man, I just want someone to be there for me. God says, I am. I always have been. Everyone else may forsake you. Everyone else may leave you. But God says, I never will. I will be faithful to be there. Here's another problem you're going to have. You will be discouraged by your own failures. How many of y'all failed this week? Everybody get your hands up. We all did it. A lot of times we fail time and time and time again. We get discouraged. Sometimes we just want to give up. Why even fight if we're going to fail all the time? 2 Timothy 2.13 If you believe not, Yet, abide, yet he, if ye believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If we don't act in unbelief, he doesn't change. His disposition never changes. He will never deny us. He, if we are unfaithful to him, but God is never unfaithful to us. Here's another problem you're going to have. You will struggle with fear of the future. That's what a lot of us deal with. The future's scary. I look at the world that's happening now. I look at all these special snowflakes who throw a fit and riot because their football team lost the Super Bowl or their person didn't get in the office. And you look at me like, seriously? This, this is the future of our country? God help us. And we look at the future and think, man, I just don't have any idea what's going to happen. Psalms 121.8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. There's an old song I haven't heard in a long time, but I listened to it this week preparing for this. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from, the, from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I walk beside him. For he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. We don't have any idea what's going to happen tomorrow, but God's already there. And he promised to take care of us no matter what. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but God is there with his love, his grace, his mercy, and his desire to rescue us. Here's another problem we're going to have. Without a clear view of his faithfulness, we will have little testimony for God, and also we will have little trust for God. God's faithfulness fuels our our faith. God is always predictable. God will always do what he says. God will always keep his word. He will always love us. He will always forgive us. And if you don't believe his faithfulness, if you don't believe his, his promises to you, then his promises will have little impact on you. You know, when me and April went to Bible college, we, we didn't have any money, to be honest with you. Our first week there, after we got moved in, I started the job, and uh, I had to go for training to Elgin, Illinois, which was several, uh, it was about an hour down the road. And I had to go through, I think, six tolls to get there. 
We, got, we moved up there. We had this big jar of change. I had to empty out that jar to pay the tolls to get to three days of training. And by the time the three days were over, we, I used all the change. I, used all my, I had no money, nothing. Time and time again, we'd, we'd go to the pantry and there'd be no food there. And we'd go to the checkbook and it'd be empty as well. And we'd think, what are we going to do? Well, I guess we're just going to have to trust God. I never missed a meal in college. There were, there were several times we would come home and someone would put a, basket, a box of food on our plate, on our porch. There were times we'd check the mail and there'd be a random check there from a relative, my mom, my, my Jehovah's Witness mom, God used to pay our bill sometimes. Our church, they would just randomly take up an offering and send us money. And every time we got down, so it's like, God, I don't know where you're gonna, how you're going to do this. God always came through. God always showed himself faithful. We left Bible college, we went on deputation, didn't have a job, just started knocking doors, just started calling churches to try to get, get, get support for this church, and of course didn't have any job going on, and suddenly, you know, about a month of not working, guess what, you know, you got bills due and no money, but God always came through. Go to the check, go to the mailbox, and there'd be a check there. Just story after story after story where when it seemed like God was going to forget us and forsake us and leave us, the last second God always showed up and gave us what we needed. So after years of seeing God take care of us, seeing God keep his word, I'll be honest with you, starting this church didn't scare me at all because I knew God was going to take care of us. Because I knew, God, I'm doing what you asked me to do, so guess what? You've always been faithful, and you always will be. But if you don't believe the faithfulness of God, you're going to struggle trusting him, trusting him to take care of you, to watch after you. God is faithful and he will always do what he says he will do. You know, I have a lot of things I struggle with in my walk with God. I'm not perfect. I don't want you to think I'm, I'm not even, I can't even see perfect from where I'm at. There's a lot of struggles I have, but I trust God. That's one thing I can say. I struggle with a lot, but I trust God. I know God will be faithful. And why? Because I've seen his faithfulness. I've seen him take care of me. I've seen him keep his word. I've seen him keep his promise. But if you don't believe the faithfulness of God, your prayers will have little impact on you because you're not going to believe that he's going to answer. People will let you down. Always. The fact of the matter is, I'm probably going to let you down one time. If I haven't already. People will always disappoint you. But God never will. God is always faithful. He will always keep his word. He will always provide for us. He will always take care of us. He will always give us mercy. He will always give us forgiveness. He will always give us grace. He will always give us love. No matter what you face tomorrow, he's already there waiting for you because he's always faithful. My soul can rest and can have quiet when I believe in God's faithfulness and I understand that his faithfulness is more than enough for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.